Oh, man, I wish I would have been here last time. I fucking love these guys. I fucking love this guy. Really listen up. What's up? Yeah, why? Come on. Come on. Yeah. I already did one. We're doing this again. I already did it. I didn't make it. I did it again. I had Rex in the middle. I was like, oh yeah, final boss time. Yeah, I'm like, it's like, don't show us. Yeah, you're not the only one. I want to get on this meme. Yeah, I'm pretty warm. It's not going to get us at all. I'm like, sure how. Don't feel it. There's the highlight. Oh, you're happy. I don't. Tough year. Yeah. I know. I know. I didn't hear you say it, but. Oh, we're ready. We're ready. Are you ready for us? Ready's ready. Let me just do some housekeeping. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Good to see everyone again. Glad to be back. Um, Hire us. Yeah. Hire us. <laughs> a good way to become <laughs> colleague friends. The idea for this too is we're going to put this online. Alrighty. Alright. Go. Let it rip, Tater Chip. <laughs> okay, so we're going to try to make this as like linear as possible as you would go through putting these together. So we're going to start with lenses. Um, talked a little bit on Tuesday, but since a lot of you guys weren't here, um, I'll just do it again. So the, there's a difference between an F stop and a T stop. So T-stop is for like geared towards cinema and videography only, while F-stop is geared towards like more photography, but it, it, it's versatile, like you can do both. Um, and I haven't found a difference between the F and the T other than it's it just it, like a differentiator. Um, F-stop goes by like just the millimeter only, like, oh, we are at 24 or you're this, even if you're using a prime lens. And then it uh, doesn't have any markings for your distance for focus, so that's why you got to use focus peaking or just use your eye, while T-stop it goes off of same system like the 1.5 to the 22. It's just your aperture range. Um, the difference is, is there's like sensors inside that like are just shaped differently and they work differently with your uh, cinema cameras. But it also goes off distance for when you're focus pulling. So you'll see here like there's a white line, and it goes all the way to this one goes to I think 12 feet, 13 feet, and then you'll use this, which we'll go over that when we get there but you just get the distance between you and your subject, and it helps with like distance between you and the background. So if it was like me to Jocelyn, that'd probably be six and a half feet. So then you would lock in, and like that's where that is. And then everything behind, and that's how you start setting the distance between like your foreground, your background, and you, it just gives you way more control of your blur when you get that math down, or if you like, it just gives you a better tool to communicate with your team. That's called the critical focus. Yes, I, I didn't know that, but th that's helpful. Yeah, <laughs> critical focus. Yes, <laughs> ah, I knew about that. Um, we did have that in the lecture, and uh, those formulas that we that are in those notes you have oops. help you with this. Yep. So, yep, that's the difference between T stop and F stop. Uh, F likes F stop will get you anything. I don't recommend taking photos with the T stop. <laughs> They'll look wonky. But th so that's th yeah, that's the lenses when you're choosing the what lenses you want to put on your rig. And then uh, with this Canon R5C, if you want to use these cinema lenses, uh, we have one right now, but uh, there's an adapter. Since this is a newer camera, it uses the RF mount instead of the EF. So to be able to use it, you just have to put on this adapter. This part goes into the RF side, and then it gives you an EF mount right there. So you can also use any older Canon glass on it. Pretty much the rule of thumb is EF is Canon DSLR, RF is designated for uh, the current crop of uh, Canon EOS sensor cameras. Uh, That's the difference. They're mirrorless. Uh, and they're mirrorless. They're mirrorless. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the Has the M mount. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Perfect. Yes. Thank so you. Yeah. But yeah, having that is nice because you can utilize your old glass. You don't have to go out and buy all new RF glass, which is what Canon probably wants you to do. But um, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing as like a Metabones on a Sony or any other camera with a different mount. You, you, can, you can buy them in different formats to be able to use lenses with whatever camera you have. Perfect, yeah. Oh, shit. Perfect for cinematography. 
And then these are the V-mount batteries. So these will be able to hook on to uh, these plates here. They can throw onto these rails. Can you do a quick demo on it? Yeah. And that, they're, they're already going to be set up this way. So you don't have to take mm -hmm. them apart. Final goal is they'll all just be in a Pelican case, and you can just pull it out, throw a lens on, and start shooting. 100% grab and go. But at the same time, take a look at it. If you want to take it apart, that's okay because that's how you're going to learn how to set it up. And, and a lot of it's just like an old Erector set or old uh, Legos. It makes it customizable to what you need for your shoot as well. Like if you need to want that more handheld look, take off the handle and just go with the cage. Like if you want to put it on a tripod that has mounting plates on the bottom, you can still do that. If you want to put it on a gimbal, tip strip it all the way off, throw it on a gimbal. Yeah, the gimbal, with, so remind you with the gimbal, it, it's too heavy. You cannot use those on gimbals. The rails and the whole rail system. Okay, it's got to, they're naked, basically. You can, but those gimbals are like $8,000. Like, the, I, the Movi. Yeah, you're getting into Movi, you're getting mm -hmm. into serious, like, Ronin stuff. It's not just, like, the three to $500 ones that you can get. Like, you're spending a pretty penny, and those are, like, cinema-based, which are cool, but... Rental houses is where you get them, yeah. typically. Even big productions don't own them, they get them rentals, too. So these V-mount batteries can clip just right on the back here. And then we're getting cables. So um, on the top of these V-mount, there's a P-tap, also D-tap, um, and then a USB. So the P-tap will go to the camera's battery. So those have, the uh, cable goes from here into the side of the camera, and then USB I think is what we're going to do for monitors, right? Or vice versa? Vice versa. Vice versa. So P-tap will go to the monitor, then USB will go to charge the camera. And the so then you can run. Right? Um, for these ones, it's different. For the Blackmagic, it's a different cable. For the R5Cs, it's USB-C. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are doing that now. They're using they're just USB-C as a general rule moving forward. Power. And these V-mount will give you the exact like voltage, the like, smart batteries, so you can't like fry the battery in your camera. And uh, then you'll be able to run everything just off of one of these. Because I think the runtime on these is. 72 volts, right? 14.8. Uh, 14.8? They go that high, OK. And uh, the runtime as 100% is 3 hours and 26 minutes on one battery. So That's with filming, too, like with record on, though. Like if they're just sitting stagnant, they'll go for like 4 to 6. Yes. Um, do building that kit out. monitors. The last yeah. thing for the for these V mounts, we're getting confused because there's P tap and there's D tap. There's no difference. D tap is what the actual plugin is called, and P tap is a brand. So like it it's the exact same thing. So if like if you, if you're worried about like buying something and it's not going to work or it's not going to fit, it, they are identical. It just somebody made P tap to make more money. So yeah. And then both these rigs have um, top panels you can throw on, so you can mount more stuff on the top, uh, like a monitor or a microphone. Maybe. You got to slide it in and then make sure that the screw goes in the hole. Yeah. I know. That's what Cole is demonstrating. He's trying to find that. While he's doing that, one last thing with the V mounts and yeah. our sub on Tuesday made a good point and kind of reminded us of it. Like, if you ever plan on flying with any of this stuff, like you have to make sure that these V mounts are like flight rated, like because they they won't let you bring some gear on there. Um, so like you got to just check the websites, check where you bought the gear from, just check whatever flights are and make sure it'll all like it'll all fly. And if I they're do. able to, they'll have that little seal on there. If you want to pass it around, you can see. They're like air approved. <laughs> Didn't know that, so that's, uh, that's good that's to know. That's something I learned last summer. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's 100 watt hours. Uh, you can have like two things that are 100 watt hours or less. I think it's one of this, something like that. So check with TSA. They'll have the exact numbers. Um, and then definitely look for like seals that say like this is able to yeah. go. And there, you there's it in your carry on luggage, you can't put it Yeah, that's that's another good point. Oh, is that, okay. like, if you're bringing gear with, like, you want to keep it in the pressurized cabin. Is it because you have to keep it in the yeah, pressurized, pressurized cabin? cabin. Yeah. So, like, you got to make sure that, like, your Pelican case, 
like can be used as a carry yeah basically. i don't know what those sizes are yeah. probably that size oh, yeah because the batteries can explode and everything yeah that's great yeah yeah and it was interesting because on that dock they brought all their equipment from la but then they rented out batteries from here and i didn't know why they did that like why they would bring hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and then rent out v-mounts but knowing that it makes sense now yeah. just because they couldn't fly with i don't know how they made 20 of them they couldn't fly they couldn't fly with 20 batteries so they had to rent them wherever they go yeah. and there's one dude in des moines that did it so if you guys want to jump on a very niche market buy a bunch of v-mount and g-mounts and rent them to productions coming through because they can't fly with them and walkies and walkies they <laughs> won't fly with walkies either yeah. And this is a side handle. Uh, so Blackmagic, you're pretty much going to have an option between recording to an SSD or using this handle, because uh, we only have u one USB-C um, port. But this just slides on the um, cage here, the side of it. Then you can adjust it however you want and tighten it. And this will give you another cold shoe mount or cord button, and then there's um, the lever here, if you press it, you can adjust the angle of how it is, just for a little more grip. And you want to talk about for the USB functions, yeah. the record button, right? Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Try when you do. You want to talk about this one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. do that demo on that. Let me do. So this, this one's just a Blackmagic monitor. You're not really going to record to this one. This is just kind of more for viewing. Um, but it pairs really well with, obviously, the Blackmagic camera. And this one is the uh, Ninja V Plus. So this has um, a terabyte of storage on the back here, this card. So it'll give you a full terabyte. You record straight to this instead of to the SD card that you have in the camera. Um, and you can like import LUTs and stuff. So if you're going to edit with a LUT, you can import it to there to see how Using it's going to look. Card, right? uh, you, you just put it onto card? the, you right. like, yep, yeah, plug you it in. You just plug into your computer and. S straight USB or C? Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. And then you load it onto there, and then you'll have it. That'll give you also a nice preview of what your edit's going to look like while you're shooting. So, so you'll be shooting in a log or raw, and you'll see what it's look like when you're done editing. So then you can adjust your raw, lo raw or log to get that color space rather than winging it and going in and hoping it works. Give you a closer idea on your exposure too, so you can see how light's working and all that. I think the coolest thing about that too is it basically, it can give you a higher recorder setting than your camera's <coughs> capable of doing. So even if it was like to throw it on my camera, which like can only shoot 4K 24, you can record up to 8K in this, which is like, oh cool, 8K, but like the main thing is that you have a terabyte of storage and then you can record at a higher bit rate for your color. So like if your camera only has 8-bit recording, it'll just use this sensor and you can still record 10-bit 422 through this, which is nice, plus that added storage. So the 422, what that'll mean is less compression on your video, more latitude, if you remember that lecture where we looked at the dynamic range, so more realistic colors, uh, give you that Michael Bay look that I know you're all, you know, really excited. Less compressed than H.264. For the Black Magic, are you guys recording directly to the card in the Black Magic bed, or are you recording to the SSD? Card in the Black Magic. Yeah. This is just to give you a different monitor. Gotcha. Especially this because the yeah. V mount blocks your your monitor, so you can't control any yeah. of your camera settings from that monitor. Yeah. Whereas this one, you can? Question mark. Now your camera settings. You no. can control your record settings okay. if you're just recording to in. this. Yep. So that's why, like, for this setup, I'd recommend like having this little your one on the camera you monitor can. out. So then you can oh, see. Yeah, flip it out. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's on the yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you can flip it out, and then you can see all your camera you settings, and you can see your record settings. Yeah. So this is what you mean, flip it out, because again, you flip it out before you put the beam out. Yeah, before you put the beam out. I'm gonna take the beam out off this real quick. Let you guys for a moment. So the cool thing about these beam mounts, we've tried them a bunch of different ways. I think the most practical for like the weight of your camera and the balance and everything that you can do is up top behind it. This. But the cool thing about these mounts in general is that all these little spots, these can come off with just with a little Allen wrench, and you can mount this anywhere. So you can undermount it on your camera, oh, yeah. you can flip that upside down. So there's ways to still see your monitor, but like 
If you had longer rails, it kind of makes sense where you could go underneath the rails and you would just flip this up like this. But for this, like, these are what, 12 inch rails? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. just for the 12 inch rails, it makes the most sense to like that. But it's, that's all to the user. And that's why these rails are so cool is because if you don't like the way we set it up, you can take all of these off, manipulate some stuff around and make it exactly what you want. So you see, this, that's what a lot of these yeah, things are that when we talk about cinema camera, it's making sure you have power. That's really it. Power, monitor. Uh, if you're yeah. shooting in log, the ability to put in a LUT to, so to give you a preview. And sound. And really your sound, are you recording on board? Not always, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, so your backup. Like the black magic camera. Yeah. Yeah, and it's your reference. So yeah, it's a reference. Exactly. And it's your reference. That's it's it. There for the cloud for you, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just keep that in mind. That's what a lot of this stuff is. It's, it's about building out the rig that works for you. Yeah, and just as like experience too, I do recommend having an onboard mic, like whether you plug it into your camera directly or to a recorder or something, just for syncing, yeah. especially when you're doing a situation like this where we're labbed up and his camera is capturing audio. If the cleanest signal you have there, it's going to make it way easier to merge your footage mm -hmm. so that it matches exactly. You don't have to spend a lifetime trying to match it up. One more thing I will add about the Blackmagic camera. Um, I was going to show this, actually, because yeah. I'm very familiar with the system. Um, you don't really have to know a whole lot, or you don't really accommodate having like the no monitor thing, because you're able to adjust your settings with these three buttons up by the record button there. You hit the button and then you move this little dial right here. And then as long as you can like barely see your monitor, you can at least see what the number is. Or you can see it on your assist there. So you don't have to like flip out the monitor and like make sure that it like looks a certain way. Um, like your monitor, like, like you flip it out so you can at least kind of see what it's, what it's saying, but you don't have to like know uh, um, exactly like what's going on on that, mon on that monitor. Cause you'll be able to see it one on this and then you don't have to like use that monitor to adjust settings. There's three buttons there and you can adjust your three different things for the most part. You uh, really don't have yeah. to pull it out too much. Usually no, we would say pull it out to help with the heat, <coughs> but then yeah. it pushes the heat out yeah. so it doesn't There's not a, the, the vent on that is yeah. not behind the, the line. Yeah, it's got, it's got vents it's on, already. It's underneath. So it's already designed for yeah. it, so you don't need to do it for heat. Yeah. Yeah, it's Another thing with all these cages is that I think on all of them they at least have some type of um, little tools. Yeah. So this one has a little... The tilted ones do. Tilta, mm -hmm. and then this one has an Allen wrench with it as well, a small Allen wrench. So they all just go in there magnetized. So when you're done using them, just put them back on those magnets. Uh, for the V mount for this Ninja, you're going to use this, which is like a false battery that has a little port. So you'll plug it in just like how you, you would plug in um, a normal battery, and then you can plug into that, and that'll give you constant power from a V-mount battery, or from a wall, if you're close to a wall, if you're like set up to do an interview for a couple hours. Yeah, and the black, because the black magic does go direct, right? We don't need a dummy battery for it? Nope. And the same thing with the R5? Yeah. They're both cables, right? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Not yet. Soon to be. Soon to be. <laughs> They're on order, right? They will be today. Today. <laughs> they will be. Do you have any so you can just use the batteries. Oh, okay. Should just talk about the test? Yeah. Yeah, or do you want to talk about the C stand? I think both of them, we like need, the, like, we need the battery hookups for all of them right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, still need them all. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to do it on the Black Magic because we'll see it on the soon. Yeah, so we're going to hook up for the Black Magic rig? Or? I was just asking whether or not the other one has direct The R5, right? The R5. Oh, like a way to go R5 straight from the battery? This? Yeah. Right? Um, this monitor specifically, yes, no. It or does it? Have but not to V mount. Yeah, it's a 12 volt port instead of like that battery delete. Um, so it's just a different cable that we'd use, but it would still come from the P or D tap off the battery. Those batteries last a while, though. It's just a monitor. Yeah. Yeah, there's we're not doing any like heavy recording to it. Like there's just two Canon batteries. I think so. those are five hours. Mm -hmm. So you should be okay at least. Yeah. Since they're not doing anything else. <coughs> oh. Um, for your reference, too, going forward, it, as your own set, the notice some of them have dots, right? These red dot versus a, a line. That's also you can tell the difference between an EF versus an RF mount. Uh, EF 
the RF You don't mount, need that with this. Which are the newer Sorry. ones over here. Sorry, they should be Silly boy. Like I'm just not used to that. Okay. Keep that in mind. If it's a dot, like black magic, that's, an, uh, that's a yeah. DS mount. Okay, so keep that in mind going forward. Older Canon DSLR glass. Or cine glass. Or cine glass. Um, and this one, as you can see here, the line. It's more of a line instead of a dot. These guys are the mirrorless EOS Canon mounts. Yeah. All right. That's the difference between them. So that'll be that will be helpful you when you're if you are on the set you and the cinematographer tells you go grab me the right lens, so you'll know you don't need to bring back the wrong lens. Oh. Yeah. Oh no. Because they will. They could yell. Mm -hmm. Um, one one thing about all these kits is that we like oh, marked no, them with tape, no, okay. so you'll all, like for this Black Magic kit, it's all yellow. So the matte box has a little yellow tape. Tascam has some, um, just various different things. The follow focus, which you put on the wrong one. I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're all, they're all marked. It, they're all marked with yellow. So just make sure all the yellow goes back in one case, and you'll be good. And once we get that digital form of like checking out gear, that'll be important that like everything comes back as it left, all one kit. Oh yeah, show that follow focus, that's really cool. Yeah. All right, so the follow focus, for most of your other lenses, unless you're using the Cineus, they'll have like a wraparound brace that you wrap around like uh, your focus on it, just so that way it can stick to the tilta or the tilta can like actually control it but the cool thing with these cines is that since they're basically expecting you to do that that's why they have like the actual ridges on there yeah, very, um yeah. yep so then you you go to like your little, little white line on the side and this is where like the distance between you and your subject comes into play so like and then you'll have like little locks so if you're at two feet three inches Put a lock in there, unscrew your little lock, screw it in, and now you're locked in. It won't let you go, so you're locked into that. So then you're set, now you've set the focus range for your subject, and let's say you want to go to 20, or you can't. Yeah, you can. So that's how when your character runs in the one shot, they run from all the way back to the front and they're still in focus? That's what, you're, that's what that person's doing, like, timing it with Yep, you. so now it's 2 to 20, and you're locked in. And that's how you get control of your scene. We're not shooting huge, huge productions, so, like, this is all you'll want. It'll always be smoother. It'll always, always give you more control. But, like, if you're on an actual film set, 90% chance, if the budget's there, they're going to have a fizz. And uh, so, it ha like, the camera hierarchy on sets will go DP, first AC, second AC, camera PA. So the first AC doesn't really do shit, like in the forms of like touching a lot of the equipment or like actually helping like the D the DP. It's just the voice between the DP and the second AC. So what a lot of it does is like you hear the DP grumble something of like I wish I had an 85. The first AC will get on the second AC. The second AC is the equipment runner, does all that stuff. So what the first AC does, filling its time, is it runs the fizz, which is focus iris zoom. And what they'll have is they'll have a little monitor and this won't be like it'll still have this but there'll be an adjustable motor to it that talks to something else via bluetooth and so they'll have their own monitor and they'll like most of the time they'll use a small rig they'll have like the neck strap two handles on the side and they'll have a fo like they'll have another one on that and they'll pull focus for the dp so all the dp has to worry about is getting the shot and it's up to the focus puller or the first ac to like lock those in so they'll never have to do it so it's really hard to work your way up to a dp but if you just want to point stuff and make it look cool and then everyone else does all the work for you spend 10 years trying to become a dp because first ac is where all the hard work actually comes in and making sure the shots like it works because the first ac from those fizzes they can also adjust camera settings because just like these when these venices or these aries or these reds are rigged out like this is the baby version of what they have these are probably like ten thousand dollar kits on one they're working with eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars depending on what lens they put on at the time they're not worried about their settings, so like the first AC will also set the ISO, it'll set the aperture, it'll set everything, and then the DP will just look in their monitor, communicate to the first AC, first AC will set all of that up for them, and then they just hold it and shoot. 
and the first AC. It literally hits from like, sets all the settings, make sure you're in focus, and hits record is all in the first AC. Like the DP literally, yeah, like I said, just points the camera at stuff. So, yep, if you really want to get into that, the, like this is like the beginner level of hands down like the most important job on set, which is first AC in my opinion. At the very least, the role reversal does. Yes. yes. <laughs> if the first so AC is off, everybody's off. Well, if one person's off, the whole thing's off. But like, yeah. if your first AC is off, it's really going to be a problem. Yeah. <coughs> Questions? I guess anything, anything on the setup? The last thing we have is audio. We'll talk about the TAS cam real quick. Um, so with this, you get it's technically six inputs because it counts these two microphones, which is just like the DR40 that we've used before. But then you get four Im additional inputs compared to the DR40, just the two on the bottom. Um, right now we're running our three labs and that overhead on it. Um, the other cool thing about these is that they can record in 32-bit float uh, for your level there, which is just a lot easier to clean up in post and you can like raise it without gaining noise or anything like that. You can lower it without losing like that compression that it gives you. It also, um, for stuff like booms and stuff, it's pretty easy to turn on phantom power. There's just a button here. It looks like a little speaker. You click it and then turn on phantom power for that. So you can send phantom power out of just one input as opposed to like all four of them. I think everything we have is 48, right? 48 volts? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. So you usually have your option of 4824. Uh, typically, you're going to be doing 48 unless otherwise you pull it, right? So you want to do the beast cam. Yeah. So when you record on that TAS cam, though, you'll get, so right now we have four channels running. So you'll get five files per recording. You'll get each individual, and then you'll get one mix of all of it. So if you just wanted to cut out like if you accidentally recorded the first two channels out of the TAS cam, you can cut those and mix everything else together. And on the phantom power, though, it is important. If you have a powered mic and you're running phantom power, what will happen? You can fry the mic. Boom. Yeah, so that's very important. Uh, just be aware of that. If you don't know, ask someone. Please, always ask. Always ask, always ask. Everyone's pretty friendly. Shotgun mics are going to pretty much always be powered unless they're powered. This one, yeah, this one can be powered, so you don't need Phantom. But since I already put it up, I don't feel like turning it on. We just turn on Phantom and didn't turn on the microphone. And it works. Same. Oh, no, you left it off, right? Yeah, it's off. Yeah. Okay, so if it's off, Phantom. Yeah. Because they do have batteries in them too, but something that happens over time as that battery starts to die, the quality of your recording yeah. from the mic goes down too. The it's easier just to phantom power it. Yeah. And the easiest thing to do with these mics, especially if like all of the branding is gone, start with phantom power off. And if you're not getting a signal in, turn phantom power on. And if you're still not getting a signal, turn phantom power back off because it's a problem with your mic. Yeah. But that's just the easiest one because if you plug like some of these really nice high end condenser mics that like or in the audio ones are like four or five thousand dollars. If you like if you plug those in with phantom power, you'll, you'll hear a quick little pop inside of the mic and then they're done. Like they're done forever. So um, quick thing with the C stands, probably stuff everybody already knows, but it's always nice, especially when you have weird weighted stuff like this. The weight always goes over the tallest leg because if it falls, it's going to fall on the tallest one. Uh, sandbag always goes on the tallest because of the sandbag touching the ground. The ground is holding all the way to the sandbag, and it's not actually giving any structure to the C stand. And then when, uh, on both arms, base, uh, always have them on the right side because if you start to fall forward, it'll tighten itself as it falls. Like, but if you have it on the left side and it falls, it'll it'll loosen, it'll loosen it. So, yeah. So that's just like always on the like, yep. Weight over the tallest, sandbag on the tallest, all your tightening is on the right basic, side. Basically, it's yeah. Leaning, it's tightening, it's not going anywhere. Yep. It, it's yeah. holding itself up. That's one way to tell immediately whether someone has experience or not. They're like, oh, it's a little stuff people on set notice. Yeah. Any questions, anything at all? Yeah, good. Remember, when in doubt, just ask. Always, always. Even if you have a little bit of doubt, you need the quick refresher, you're good. Anything else? Monitors, lenses, follow focus.
focus, lenses, like the other lenses, batteries, rail. Batteries, I guess. Like you'll still, even with the V-mount, you'll still need a battery and the camera. It, basically the V-mount just charges that battery that's in the camera. You can't just run it straight off. Quick question, uh, microphones, right now they're all just available? Is that how you set them up? We marked the ones that are 100% working and good with a green piece of tape. And there's a couple in there that need attention and they're marked with an orange piece of tape. So, real quick, just grab the green one first. Yeah, grab green. Because we, we got to take those to the shop, right? That's the problem we got to do. Mm -hmm. Those are the box. What? No, they're the So they're just kind of. Do you guys all know what like NV filters, polarizing filters, UV, and all that stuff is? Let's go over them. Real quick. <laughs> you have them. We have, we have an ND filter. So an ND filter is what it, so like you set your camera to the native ISO so you're gonna get no grain on it. And then if you're outside, instead of adjusting your exposure with your ISO, you're gonna use the attachments you have on your camera. So you use an ND filter, which is, does nothing but filter light in and out. Neutral density filter. And so, and these are circular drops. Um, they also have square drops. The square drops are more expensive, but it's, they're more expensive because the square drops will fit on any size of camera ever. Uh, these ones are, really geared toward the four size of the like size up rings that we have or if it's small enough where you can just attach the matte box to it and then you'll attach it to the rails um that's a quick on the nd filter polarizing filter will take a little bit of light filtering out but it'll also take reflections out of things so if you're trying to shoot water you're trying to shoot a mirror you're trying to shoot cars not mirror that's probably a bad example um, but like through a window and you're getting reflections you move your polarizer and it'll take the reflections out of <coughs> all of that um and then the uv one is just a sensor protector and then they have like like neutral gold, neutral blue, where it'll add blue to all your shots, gold to all your shots, anamorphics, fish eyes. Like the filters are never ending, but if you're gonna start with something, just get UV, polarizing, and ND. And those will get you through 99% of what you need to do unless you're trying to really go for a mood or a theme. So the, the, the theme of it is it won't affect your color, but it does affect the luminance. Okay, the white balance, the white and black level, not the color level. So like yeah. this R5C, it's native ISO is 640 or 3200. So if you're shooting outside and you're at 60, uh, 640, even though the ISO can go down to 100, that's not what the camera sensor likes for film. So you're gonna keep it at that 640. So you'd pop on the neutral density filter and then you'd get your gray balancing to where you want it rather than just ruining your camera settings. Like you wanna keep that camera at native ISO no matter what. And the filter is just one way to control the filters will also, um, some people will talk about them in stops. Usually in photography, we talk about them in stops. Where they'll say, depending on how dark it is, it'll drop you, I think, up to four. The more expensive ones. It's the, it's yeah, the I think it's six. Yeah. It's six now? Yeah. And the square ones, they won't do the variable. Yeah, they'll just have, you'll have a quarter, a half, a full. Like, it's, yeah. they'll have a backpack full of all of them. Yeah. And those are, those are meaning quarter stops. Because before, the difference is with analog photography, just uh, and even cinematography, um, we didn't have those in between stops. It was all full stops. So you had the F1, F2, or F16, etc. Now you can do there's what the quarters through the one to two, two to three. So you have a lot of both options. That's for your remember lighting the light in. The bigger the hole, the higher the also the uh, depth of field. The smaller the hole, uh, makes most everything in focus. So again, those are the things that you also want to think about as you're planning your shot with your cinematographer. Do I want to have everything, a lot of bokeh, only certain things in focus, or do I want to be able to see the whole face? The difference between a wide shot and a close-up. All right, any questions, anybody? All righty. Thank you. Thank Good you. job. Thank you. Thank you.